Thank you, Professor Khalidi, for joining us on Minority Views Podcast. We really appreciate it. I guess we should just get into it. My first question for you, sir, is how would you describe what is taking place in Gaza right now? Um, what is happening is a genocidal humanitarian catastrophe. To describe it as a humanitarian catastrophe implies natural causes, earthquake, tsunami, forest fire. Uh, this is a man-made humanitarian disaster. And the people who are making it are the Israeli military and the United States government. Uh, they are responsible for the forced displacement of close to 1.8 million Palestinians from their homes, the destruction of most of the infrastructure of Gaza and the starvation and dehydration of a large part of the population. They are actively engaged in doing this. So it's not a humanitarian ca catastrophe in the sense of a natural disaster. It's a man-made um, catastrophe. And the people who are making it are guilty probably, I, this is up to a court to decide, of war crimes. Uh, of an unprecedented nature. There have been similar war crimes in places like Syria and other places in the Middle East, certainly in Myanmar and Sudan. Um, this is on that level in terms of mass starvation, mass displacement, um, and the death of so very many people in such a short time. More civilians have been killed in Gaza than were killed in two years of the, nearly two years of the Ukraine war. So we're talking about an, uh, uh, perhaps not unprecedented, but an extraordinary uh, a catastrophe caused by caused by decisions made by men in Israel and U.S. government. Yeah, I saw a headline from the New York Times recently that said that ninety percent of Gaza is facing mass starvation, and I wondered what do you call it when ninety and more and hundred percent is facing mass starvation? And we're going to get to the some of the lexicon of this conversation, but it seems to me that where we st start this story, Professor, matters. Mm -hmm. What year we started in, how we start this story. So where do you think this story starts and where should people think about where this story starts? I mean, it obviously has multiple starting points. One starting point, the obvious one that one side is trying to impose as the only permissible, morally justifiable one is October 7th. Before October 7th, nothing had ever happened. Everything was perfect. Life was normal. Uh, everything was just hunky-dory. And then suddenly, out of the blue, a horrific assault uh, on Israeli military and then on Israeli civilians took place. If you take that point of view and assume that the imprisonment of Palestinians in Gaza is normal and the people living one mile outside that border should be able to not pay any attention to that, then your starting point is clear. Something horrible happened to Israelis on the 7th of October, and that's where we should start. Um, that's only one possible starting point. I think of, there are several other equally valid starting points, frankly. One would be the many wars on Gaza, um, starting with the siege of Gaza that begins in the early 2000s, continuing through attacks on Gaza in 2008, 2009, 2012, 2014, and so forth, 2021, and, and so on. Um, all of which led to lopsided uh, casualty tolls, most of which involved a, a preponderance of civilians on the Palestinian side and relatively limited casualties on the Israeli side, if any. Um, that's another starting point. Uh, Israel has immiserated the population of Gaza by besieging them, by limiting their caloric intake, by restricting their movement. In fact, preventing the movement of the overwhelming majority of them out of Gaza together with Egypt, which is party to this siege. Um, and that's another place to start, the siege of Gaza. Uh, yet another place to start is where did the people who live in Gaza come from? They're not Gazans. They're not people who are from Rafah or Khan Yunus or Deir al all of whom, which were communities that existed uh, for centuries. I mean, Gaza goes back to pre-biblical times, uh, pre-Philistine times, in fact. Um, most of the population of Gaza are the descendants of refugees driven there by Israel in 1948 from Jaffa, uh, the southern parts of Palestine, uh, the area around Bir Seba, Bir Sheva today. Uh, and some of the Israeli border settlements, uh, which are established on the ruins of Palestinian villages. So that population is a population made up of people 
forced out of their homes in order to create a Jewish state in a majority Arab country in 1948. And so you could probably start there, or you could go back to the British and uh, start as I start in my book uh, with the Balfour Declaration, which I think begins this struggle in the trajectory and in the, the with the characteristics that we know it. Uh, so we go back to the Balfour Declaration, we go back to Britain's occupation of Palestine, we go back to the British mandate. That's another place to start. You could start it with the rise of Zionism in the 1890s, modern political Zionism. There are various starting points, some more obvious than others, but I think all of them relevant. One of the talking points I've seen recently, and it comes up frequently, but especially in this war, Professor, is the Palestinians have rejected every offer of statehood that was presented to them. Could you address that statement? And could you also address it in the context of the Camp David talks in 2000? Let me first be very clear about what we are talking about. Are we talking about a one state, one Bantustan solution, in which case the Palestinians are the Palestinian leadership is completely guilty of never having accepted such a solution. If that is what we are talking about, one superior people with absolute rights of self-determination and of security to be ensured by the insecurity of others, then there are clearly a number of offers that the Palestinians have rejected. If we, however, are talking about not a quote-unquote generous offer, which it, in the, in the views of some people means anything we, any crumbs we choose to throw you off the table after taking the, the cake for ourselves, then you have to look very carefully at the only times when Israeli leaders actually made such offers. The first would have been uh, the Oslo Accords. Uh, Prime Minister Rabin uh, made unprecedented shifts in the Israeli position, uh, which I can talk about. Um, but at the end, what he said in his last speech was very explicit. What Israel is offering the Palestinians is less than a state. Those are his words. His last speech before he was murdered by an Israeli extremist who had thought he had gone too far and who was the spiritual heir of the people who are running Israel today. So that, I mean, if you consider less than a state, a generous offer, we have a state, we have sovereignty, we have international recognition, we have everything including control over the security of this other people, and you have less than a state. And in that same speech, he said, Israel would retain security control over the Jordan River Valley and its crossings, meaning Israel would be the sovereign and there would be one state. So that's what I would call a one state, one Bantustan offer. Was that not enough for the Palestinians? Yes. Sadly, they think of themselves as a people with inalienable national rights and are not willing to be subordinated to another people or to have their security controlled by another people. That's what Rabin was offering. In his own words, I didn't make that up. It's his last speech. It's in the Israeli Knesset records. Now, what uh, the, the second Israeli prime minister to make a so-called generous offer uh, was uh, Prime Minister Barak at Camp David. And again, he modified some of the terms of, uh, of what Rabin and the labor government of the mid 1990s was offering. But essentially, essentially what was on offer there and what was on offer later in the negotiations between a later prime minister, Ehud Olmert and uh, uh, Mahmoud Abbas, then president of, of the Palestinian Authority, uh, was in essence no different. Israel was not willing to give up security control. Israel was not willing to remove its settlements in the 22% of mandatory Palestine that would supposedly have become some sort, of, some sort of Palestinian statelet. Israel was not willing to give up complete control over Jerusalem. I could, East Jerusalem, Arab East Jerusalem. I could go on and on. So we were not talking about anything generous, except in terms of, of someone who considers themselves entitled to anything and who feels that giving anything to uh, the other side, which is not entitled to anything, is generous. I, I dispute, I would dispute in detail any of these offers. I would even go back to something that was not offered by Israel, something that was offered by the United Nations General Assembly in 1947, which was an Arab state in less than 45% of a country which had a two-thirds Arab majority. You are two-thirds of the population. You consider yourself to have an inalienable right of self-determination. And most of your country, including the richest land, most of which your people own, is being given to a minority. 
There's nothing generous about that. In fact, there's nothing just about that. It required tearing a country in half and giving most of it, including most of the better bits, the most fertile bits uh, and so forth, to a minority. So again and again, the Palestinians are castigated for having refused scraps from the table when in fact, in their view, which one may dispute, of course, they were entitled to self-determination in their own country, whether in 1947 or in 1995, 93, 94, 95, when Rabin was negotiating with the PLO or uh, later on in the early 2000s. The <clears throat> many of those negotiations were under the auspices of the United States. Mm -hmm. I had Noam Chomsky on this podcast, and he told me that the most pro-Israel president in recent memory was Barack Obama until Trump came into office. What is Biden? What has been Biden's approach to Israel? Has it worked? And um, how do you think the president truly views Palestinians? Does he view Palestinians as human beings? Every American president in certain core respects has been fundamentally pro-Israel. There has only in American political discourse been one narrative, which is an Israeli narrative, ever since Woodrow Wilson. Uh, in those days, it was a narrative rooted in Christian Zionism. It's since developed. But that was the only narrative there was. There was no Palestinian narrative. The Palestinians didn't exist for American presidents. And they don't exist for American presidents, in my view. I would guess that there are a couple of American presidents who are aware of the fact that they existed, but gave that existence very little consideration. As far as this president is concerned, I think he perhaps, I'm not sure what Noam would say about this. Uh, I'd be interested in hearing his views. I think he may have won the title of the most pro-Israeli American president ever, uh, if that were ever in dispute. Um, and this for two reasons. Firstly, he seems to believe viscerally in the complete innocence and virtuosity of Israel. He believes every lie that's spun by their massive, brilliant propaganda machine. I don't think there is a single false utterance that Israel has, has canonized and has made uh, sacred that the president wouldn't repeat with feeling and with belief and with tears in his eyes. Uh, I believe this is a man who is a true believer. That's the, that's the first part. The second part is that he doesn't see Palestinians. For him, I believe they don't exist. It's perfectly clear from the way in which he's talked about Palestinian casualties, for example, publicly. It's perfectly clear uh, from the way in which he talks about an American Israeli's death with deep, deep emotion and has never expressed the slightest emotion about tens of thousands of Palestinian deaths, uh, 22,000 at this point uh, that we're recording this, uh, this entry. Uh, of whom seven, eight, nine thousand are children, and two or three or four thousand are women. So clearly, non-combatants. Many are old people. Many others are civilians. Uh, not once has the president expressed the slightest sympathy for those tens of thousands of of, of killed and the sixty or fifty thousand people who have been maimed, or the hundreds of thousands of people who are starving right now. Um, his administration has talked about humanitarian this, humanitarian that, and has done almost literally nothing to force Israel to relieve the humanitarian catastrophe that Israel has caused with the support of the United States. So I would say he's by far the most pro-Israel president uh, of, of any of the ones that we've seen so far, going right back to Woodrow Wilson or Harry Truman. Yeah, and I think we saw that before October 7th as well, the lack of regard for Palestinians in the Abraham Accord negotiations with the other states, um, continuing the Trump policy of viewing the occupied Palestinian territories and the settlements as as uh, acceptable under international law or not de facto illegal. Right. But it seems to me that there's you're a... Correct, you're correct in saying that the Biden administration did not overturn one of the remarkable pro-Israel initiatives of the Trump administration, and in fact, took some of them farther. Yeah. It seems to me, though, that the politics of this conflict have changed um, mm -hmm. among young people, among people of color, among more organized Muslims and Arabs. We see what's happening in Michigan, and that President Biden and his advisors are going to be in for a rude awakening this year. Um, what do you say to those Arab and Muslim voters and young voters who have had it with President Biden and will not support him this year? Doesn't matter what progressive legislation he's passed or proposed because they don't want to co-sign onto a genocide. 
I think you're right that the politics have fundamentally changed in the United States. They've changed globally as well. International public opinion was generally supportive of the Palestinians from very early on until right now. It's grown more so. And governments, most of which are much more interested in catering to the United States than they are to doing what their people want, um, and, some, and some of which are very strongly pro-Israel, have been forced to modify their stances or to be even more outspoken in their support of the Palestinians. So there's a global change, and there's a, there's a change in the politics of this country at the grassroots. It's extremely important, I think, to stress that. There has been absolutely no change in the wall-to-wall -wall blind support for Israel of the political elites, of the corporate elites, of the, uh, of the elites that dominate our, 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 pri public insti our private institutions like universities and, and art galleries and, and museums and so forth. Those people are still wall-to-wall -wall supportive of Israel. And anybody who dares to contravene that consensus is drummed out immediately uh, of the club. However, at the grassroots, there has been a fundamental change, primarily among young people and minorities, who, by the way, make up the majority of the American population, depending on how you count them, um, but also among many other morally uh, concerned Americans, ordinary Americans, middle American, Amer middle America Americans, such that public opinion now is running very much against Biden's policy on Gaza such that public opinion is running very strongly in favor of a ceasefire, irrespective of the insistence of the Israelis on continuing the war for months and years, irrespective of the Biden administration's insistence that Israel has an absolute right to continue to do that, and irrespective of administration spokesmen echoing every Israeli talking point that they're ever, that's ever placed in front of them. Public opinion has shifted. There's no question. Um, and I think that you may be right. This may well, assuming Biden still is the candidate uh, in November of this year, assuming uh, that um, this war continues, as it unfortunately may, for another couple of months, um, that there are going to be an enormous number of people who will, under no circumstances, vote for a person whom they consider uh, to be complicit in genocide, which is the president of the United States and his administration. And this may well lead to a catastrophe for not only President Biden and the Democratic Party, but for the United States. Because the alternative is going to be uh, very likely, assuming he is the Republican candidate, a Trump victory, thanks to the policies of President Biden on Gaza, as well as other failures uh, of this administration and of this president, a, a failure to articulate any kind of any kind of reason for reelecting him. Let's le let's pretend the Gaza war never happened. Mm -hmm. I think the man has a serious problem to begin with, and his administration have a serious problem to begin with, which is they are incoherent. It's not just he's incoherent. They are incoherent. They make no sense. They cannot make an argument for this administration. And when it comes to Gaza, well, they've lost the public opinion battle. They still have the elites. They still have the corporations. They still have the big donors. They still have the universities, which are kicking presidents out right and left because they won't toe the line on Israel. But as far as voters are concerned, I think we're going to see in places like Michigan and possibly places like Pennsylvania, Georgia, maybe even New Jersey. Uh, Texas, uh, 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 possibly a couple of other states, that young people, minorities, Arab Americans and Muslim Americans just will not vote for genocide Joe. They will not vote for a man whom they feel is has blood on his hands. And I don't know that anything that might happen between now and November, assuming Biden continues to be the candidate, um, is, is likely to change the views of at least some of those people. And that might be enough to lose in Michigan, where he won by a couple of tens of thousands of votes in, in 2020, let the 2016, alone a few other states, let alone a few other states. Certainly. I mean, the 2020 election was closer than 2016. It was something like 100,000 votes in the Electoral College. This right. one will also be razor thin. Uh, the margins will be. Uh, on that point of Israel, though, I want to ask you, why is it that Israel elicits such unilateral support among the American political establishment? And why is there also this fear of being critical of Israel? I mean, we've all experienced this. We all know it exists. Young people have experienced it. They're less brainwashed than, than our elders. But I want to get it from you. Why is there this unilateral support and you can't also criticize Israel? I would give you two main reasons. Age and class. Age and class. Old people believe every lie, most of them, some of them, enough of them, that Israel has told 
ever since they made the desert gloom and ever since they were the only democracy and ever since I could just go on and on and on with the fables that were implanted in a whole generation of Americans in the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and which people in their 80s and 70s and 60s tend to still believe. Those are the people who control American politics. We're run by a gerontocracy. Look at the two candidates. They're in their late 70s and early 80s, if those end up being the two candidates. I mean, this is a gerontocracy. <laughs> Look at the people who run the Senate. Look at them on the Republican and the Democratic side. Uh, look at the people who run corporations. Look at the people who own the media. I'm not talking about the you know beat reporter who's 23, or the you know mid range uh, 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 mm -hmm. anchor who's 35. I'm talking about the people who own and edit and produce. They're in their 60s and in their 70s, and especially who own. So let's start with age. Old people read the legacy press. Old people watch CNN and, and MSNBC and Fox. Young people don't pay any attention to the mainstream corporate media. They don't, they, don't, they don't know about it. They don't care about it. They have contempt for it. They have alternative sources of information, which are far, far better than the legacy press. You don't have a whole stratum. I was talking to a New York Times reporter today, heavily edited is how he describes his own paper. You have layer after layer after layer of 50-year-olds, 60-year-olds, 70-year-olds, each of whose prejudices is what determines the headlines, the stories that are chosen, the organization of them on the front page if you read a physical paper, or the way in which they're arranged on the digital paper. Young people don't have that. So we start with age. The second thing is class. Rich people who tend to dominate our society also tend to be older, but they also have different views than ordinary working people. And so if you go down the social scale, if you go to the people I run into on the street, if you, the kind of people who, you know, work as doormen in buildings, the kind of people who work in bodegas, the kind of people who uh, run the buses, you will find most of them are quite sympathetic to the Palestinians and much less likely to be indoctrinated by whatever nonsense Israel has been putting out for decades and decades and decades than richer, older people. So age and class, I think, are, are the basic determinants of this. Of this, When you look at the, po the public opinion numbers, it's very clear that a majority of Americans support a ceasefire. It's very clear that corporate America is horrified by the idea, that political America at the top is horrified by the idea. It wants to let the Israelis kill as many Palestinians as it feels is necessary in order for it to achieve whatever it wants to achieve. But that's not the view of most Americans. And that's because most of them are not rich and most of them are not old. And many, very large numbers of them are members of minorities who see this through a frame that is different than the frame of, of ordinary white Americans. If you're black, you may see Jim Crow, or you may see segreg segregation, or you may see racial discrimination in Israeli behaviors. If you come from a formerly colonized country, you'll see the fingerprints of British colonialism all over Palestine. And, and so those more diverse, younger, less well-to-do populations have a different view, especially the younger ones. So I think that's what that's what explains it, what, what we're talking about, race, uh, class, uh, age. As someone who is a younger person who's a minority, I want to say for many people in my cohort, this is not complicated. This is actually very, very obvious. There's nothing complicated about it at all. I mean, yeah. it has tragic aspects. I mean, as Edward Said put it, you're talking about victims of victims. You're talking about a people that has been persecuted and hounded for its entire existence over millennia in Christian Europe, and that chooses Palestine as a refuge, but in so doing, engages in a settler colonial process, which victimizes a completely innocent indigenous population. Now, that's tragic, but there's nothing complicated about it. Holocaust survivors created a state which persecuted Palestinians. Having been persecuted, they persecuted others. What's so complicated about that? The Puritans who were persecuted in England came to North America and persecuted Native Americans. Duh, there's just nothing complicated about it. I it mean, seems... it, has, it has historical ramifications we could go into for hours. You know, the indigeneity of the Palestinians, the Jewish connection to the land of Israel, all of those things are, of course, relevant, but the basic outlines, they're not that complicated. And to say it's complicated means don't talk about it. That's what it means. Oh, it's complicated. I don't want to talk about it because I'll be punished if I say what I think, or I'll be punished if I tread on someone's toes.
it should be easy enough to talk about as a foreign policy conflict, as a moral conflict, as an anti-colonial conflict, and yet it is not. There is this great fear that exists, and I attribute that fear to the very bad conscience that the West has about what it did to the Jewish people. Let's not forget it was the German state, the Polish state, the Russian state, abetted by American and Canadian states, which closed their doors to immigration. There's a great violence and trauma that was done. And this bad conscience still exists. And we see how Germany's responded to this conflict. So how, how, how do we think about the victims of the victim, as Edward Said put it? How should we think of this in the context of the larger history, longer history of the West, which is one of genocide, extermination, and barbarism? Well, I, I think you have to take apart, I should say, you have to differentiate between the aspect which has to do with the ancient and long-lasting persecution of Jews and Christian. This is not a phenomenon that was common to other parts of the world. Jews were not uh, persecuted and, and destroyed or expelled from Arab or Muslim countries or from other countries in which they lived, South Asian countries, wherever they may have lived. Um, this is a phenomenon unique to Christianity and unique to a specific doctrinal view of the Jewish people as guilty collectively for the killing of Christ, which was doctrine in the Catholic and Orthodox churches for centuries and centuries. So there's actually this view of the Jews within certain aspects of Christian doctrine which justified the expulsion of all the Jews from England in the 12th century, the expulsion of all the Jews from France in the 13th century, the expulsion of all the Jews from Spain and Portugal in the 50, at the end of the 15th century. Now, this, this, this is the, the, the killing of, of huge numbers of Jews by the Crusaders as they marched across Europe on the way, on the way to the Middle East uh, in, in, in the late 1100s. Uh, this is a this is a historic hatred of Jews, Jew hatred, which is a Christian problem. And so I think you're absolutely right. Um, there is a deep, justifiable sense of guilt, not only for persecuting Jews, but also for failing to rescue Jews, for failing when the Nazis come to power, when it is clear, when they're trying to kick Jews out of Germany. And when they're perfectly willing before World War II starts and before the final solution, the, the Holocaust is decided upon, uh, they would allow anybody to leave who could leave. Everybody shut their doors. The United States was guilty. Britain was guilty. Canada was guilty. These are countries that could, would, and should have saved Jews had they not been run by racist bigots who did not want to allow Jews into their countries because of deep anti-Semitism in the US Congress, in the British Parliament, and so on and so forth. So I think that that part of it, the victimization of Jews historically in Christian Europe, I mean, they were the, 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 that part of it, I think, has to be very clearly delineated. And we have to understand that that's one of the root causes of, of that was causes. It's one of the, the sources of Zionism. Zionism, in part, is a reaction to a perception that it is impossible for Jews to live in a Gentile world, that they will always be persecuted in that world. And that's what Herzl was saying. Um, it's also rooted in a, in a belief in, in a connection of the Jewish people to the land of Israel. It's also rooted in the rise of modern political nationalism in Europe. Um, Eastern Europe is where uh, Zionism developed, and it, it developed as a nationalist ideology, among other nationalist ideologies in Russia, in Poland, in Austria, and so forth. Um, as far as the role of the West, I think here you have to talk about the role of British imperialism and the way in which Britain created settler colonies all over the world, starting in Ireland and continuing through North America, Australia, and New Zealand, um, as well as attempts to do the same thing in some parts of East Africa, even as other European countries were trying to do the same thing elsewhere, the French in Algeria, the Italians in Libya. And British imperialism is one of the drivers of this conflict. Britain created a mandate which established the Zionist project as a parastate in Palestine at the expense of the Palestinians and against their opposition. Britain crushed the Palestinians in the 1930s when they rose up against this infernal uh, 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 process whereby they were to be dispossessed uh, of their own country. Um, and without Britain, you would not have had modern Israel, not only in terms of all of those things that the British did during those mm -hmm. two decades of the mandate up to World War II, but also in terms of the 
legacy of British counterinsurgency doctrine that they bequeathed to the people who became the generals in the Israeli army later on. People like Moshe Dayan, uh, people like Igal Alon are trained by British counterinsurgency experts to kill, to execute captives, to blow homes up, uh, to carry out attacks at night, to always go on the offensive. The doctrine of the Israeli army, according to the Israeli army itself, it derives fr from these British counterinsurgency uh, theories. So Britain and, and British imperialism and a an approach to subject peoples, which is uh, which is obviously racist, um, is also part of this part of this story. What do you say to the argument that I I, I find creeping into the main mainstream that basically is a critique of the word colonial and indigenous mm -hmm. uh, as applied to this conflict, and is I guess indirectly a critique of of your work as well. Could you address that? There there seems to be this this notion that. That well, this is a conflict of both sides are indigenous, and this wasn't right. col colonization, etc. Right. Well, I mean, the 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 settler colonial bit is fairly easily disposed of if you just look at what Zionist early Zionists said about themselves. You know, uh, we will be a rampart for Europe against the barbarism of Asia. I mean, that's a colonial. That's Herzl. Mm -hmm. That's the founder of modern political Zionism. Mm -hmm. That's as colonial as it comes. Mm -hmm. That's as racist as it comes. That's as European. Uh, uh, that 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 bespeaks as 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 European a sense of superiority as any statement by anybody ever. Um, they saw themselves as colonialists. They believed they had a right to Palestine, of course, but they understood themselves as Europeans coming to colonize with the support of a colonial power, a country which had an indigenous population, at least the honest the honest leaders amongst. Them. Um, and I, I, in my in my book, and I, I challenge anybody who argues with this to read what Zeb Jabotinsky himself said, the man who is the spiritual father of most Israeli governments since 1977, the Begin government, the Shamir government, the, the Sharon government, the Netanyahu governments, uh, the Echud Olmed government are all Likud governments or Likud dominated governments. Uh, Likud is an extension of the revisionist Zionism, which is founded by Jabotinsky. And Jabotinsky said, this, the Palestinians are the indigenous people. They're fighting uh, settlers the way anybody would fight settlers, the way Native Americans did. I mean, he saw the Palestinians as indigenous. He said, we have a prior claim. But of course he recognized that the Palestinians were indigenous. Of course he recognized, as all of them did, that the Palestinians had a right uh, uh, to the country. But he just claimed that that Zionism provided a superior right. And he said, in any case, we have no alternative. We're being persecuted here. So the, the, the colonialism argument is really, really hard to sustain in light of what Zionist leaders themselves uh, uh, said uh, early on, um, something which is one of the main funding and land purchase agencies uh, in Palestine was called the Jewish Colonization Agency. Is this an anti-Semitic smear? by some bigot in, uh, in, a, in an Ivy League university of some Jewish patriots who are returning to their homeland as the indigenous population? No, it's what they called themselves, Jewish Colonization Agency, later Palestine Jewish Colonization Agency. It lasted until 1958. So we're not even talking about ancient history. We're talking about a, a central institution to the building up of Zionism and a, a, later on the Israeli state which called itself a colonization agency. So if they called themselves colon colonists and they called what they were doing colonization, I'm not quite sure what the problem is. Now, as far as indigeneity is concerned, the idea that the Palestinians are not indigenous is unsupportable by any historical evidence. The, 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 the overwhelming majority of the population of Palestine is made up of people who probably had as their origins the peoples who were there when the Muslim armies conquered Palestine in the seventh century. Most of the population remained Christian until the eighth or ninth or 10th century. That is to say, they slowly converted. There was no mass influx of foreigners, heaven forbid, Arabs, 12 or 14 centuries ago. There was a smattering of Arabs who dominated the society and later on, whose language and even later on, whose religion was adopted by the people who lived there. So these villages, have probably been lived in by essentially the same populations gen genetically for hundreds and thousands of years. Now, was there a Jewish population there previously? Yes. What happened to it? We don't actually know genetically. We know that some of the people in places like Iraq 
who probably had been there for thousands of years may have originally been transplanted by the, the Assyrians or the Babylonians or the Romans 2000 years ago. But to say that that gives them a claim to indigeneity is absurd. It's, it, it, this is not a modern political claim to say maybe it might be that the Jewish populations of Eastern Europe, who are the bulk of the population of Israel today, there's a large Mizrahi population as well, or a large population that originates in Arab and, and, and East, Eastern countries. But the bulk of the immigrants to Israel are Eastern Europeans. There is a possibility some of them are genetically related to populations that lived there 2,000 years ago, but maybe, maybe not. And I don't think the genetic argument is a very good one because it's likely to show that most Palestinians are also very long, have been there very, very long. So the indigenator argument, which is one that Western colonialists usually are not terribly eager to, to deal with, uh, I don't think really stands. To say that there's a biblical connection is perfectly legitimate. To say there's a religious connection is perfectly legitimate. To say that that means that every Ashkenazi immigrant to Israel is in fact indigenous to Palestine is utterly absurd. These are populations that have lived for thousands of years elsewhere, even if they originally came from here. I mean, if you're going to make those kinds of claims, then you're going to have to overturn every polity that exists. Uh, you're going to have to turn Spain back into a Muslim country. I mean, it's 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 or North Africa, as as Mussolini tried to say, back into part of the Roman Empire. I mean, all of North Africa was part of the Roman Empire. Uh, are the populations there originally uh, from uh, Rome? God knows. Hmm. But you really want to start that 2,000-year-old nonsense? I don't really think in the 21st century that kind of argument should hold any water. Now, for people who are religious, maybe. Maybe. If you believe what's in the Bible or the Quran uh, or, the, or the, uh, uh, the, the Torah, then maybe you might want to make that claim. But that's not a political claim. That's a religious claim. And anybody who's not a believer won't believe it and shouldn't believe it, can't believe it. And it cannot be carried in a 21st century argument unless you're talking about you know, people who are of the same faith, in which case you can, you know, they can make that argument. But across, uh, across faith lines, you can't make it. Is there a version of Zionism that could, re that could not result in ethno-nationalist supremacy and displacement? Does it necessitate an exclusivist identity? Or could Zionism sit alongside a Palestinian nationalism in a future uh, binational state. Is the current version of Zionism we see in power the only version of Zionism that exists now? It is not, and it never was. There always were cultural versions of Zionism. There once was a binational version of Zionism, a group called Brit Shalom, people like Gershom Shalom and a bunch of other luminaries. Um, including people like Albert Einstein, um, including people like Hannah Arendt, some of the most noted thinkers in modern history, um, espoused a, a different kind of Zionism, if, if they were Zionists at all. Um, and again, I go back to, to something that's in the beginning of my book. Um, one of my own ancestors, writing to Herzl, said to him, um, of course we understand that there's a Jewish connection to Palestine. My God, you know, Everybody accepts that. Um, everybody understands how the Jewish people are persecuted. And the idea of reconstituting your people, I mean, this is a late 19th century thinker who understood nationalism. The idea of reconstituting a people on a national basis, that's perfectly understandable. He said, just don't do it here because there's another people. In other words, implementing a Zionist idea and creating a Jewish state in a place that doesn't have an indigenous population, as far as at least my ancestor was concerned, would have would cause no problems. There's nothing wrong with the idea in and of itself of, of transforming a pre-national peoplehood or pre-national uh, religious uh, uh, entity grouping into a national grouping in and of itself, not that controversial. The problem is where they chose to do it and how they chose to do it. It ended up being a, a ethno-nationalist, uh, 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 an attempt at achieving ethno-nationalist supremacy in a country with an Arab majority. And that in and of itself is a problem. So to say a, a Jewish, the, the Jewish people have now created a modern national entity, well, that is the case. There are some Palestinians who would dispute that. They would say, no, settlers are always settlers. I, I don't agree with that. 
I think you have multiple instances of settler colonial projects that have transformed into national projects. I live in one today. I live in the United States. It's a settler colonial project. It's a national project. There's an American people. There's an Israeli people in the same way. It's a much shorter time period. But in that time period, very clearly, there is a there is a national consciousness there. The problem is how you reconcile that national consciousness and that national existence with the existence of another people, indigenous to that land, who have been largely expelled from their country in order to create this ethno-supremacist Jewish state. Um, and how you square that circle, I don't know. I mean, that's talking about the future, but in principle, is it resolvable? I would say yes, uh, a bi binational state, a state where you recognize that you have people who speak Flemish and you have people who speak French. You have people who see themselves as having one ethnicity and people who see themselves as having another. The Swiss have managed, the Belgians have managed. Um, the Irish are, I hope, on their way to manage. The South Africans, I hope, are on their way to manage. It's not irresolvable, in my, in my view. When Ta-Nehisi Coates went to um, Hebron and went to the occupied territories, he said that this was very, very familiar to him and it reminded him of what he had known in the Jim Crow South. I wonder if you could expand or, or discuss that analogy a little bit more. Yeah, for, for some reason, for a long time, that wasn't a natural thing for Americans to look at. Well, they didn't even look at the occupied territories. For many of us, it seems much more intuitive. Are they analogous, the occupied Palestinian territories and the Jim Crow South? They're certainly not identical. Well, there are so many differences. Um, but I think there are important parallels. Um, you're talking about, first of all, two legal systems. You're talking about systemic racial discrimination. You're talking about the denial of rights. And in all of these cases, there are clear similarities. Um, and so going around Hebron or going around anywhere in the West Bank with someone who has eyes to see and, and can be and, 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 and a guide to show them what's really going on um, would bring up those kinds of parallels. Um, people being denied the, the vote in one of, of one group and other or other people who are uh, who, who have the exclusive right to vote one set of people with certain rights treated under one legal system and another set of people with a different set of rights treated under another legal system uh, these are obvious parallels to jim crow to segregation um and to that kind of strange parallel legal system that that prevailed uh between uh, the end of reconstruction and the civil, civil rights era in the 50s and 60s um there are obviously differences um, I could go, I could enumerate them, but they're, they're, they should be perfectly clear. One is a case of military occupation uh, of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip by the Israeli army. It's not the same country in the sense that the United States was the same country and you had these two legal systems operating. Now, as Israel gradually absorbs the occupied territories, you actually are moving closer and closer to Jim Crow and American racial segregation because there is that same... There is, in fact, inside Israel segregation of school systems, of housing, rather similar to the to American cities even today. If you go to Chicago, it's a highly segregated city on racial lines. There are a few mixed, many mixed neighborhoods, but by and large, it's a segregated city. Israel is completely segregated. Mm -hmm. Even the so-called mixed cities, there are Arab neighborhoods and there are Jewish neighborhoods. And when Arabs start to move into a neighborhood, you have what in the United States would be called white flight. Uh, you have people leaving in droves because they don't want to live next to black people. In the case of neighborhoods in Jerusalem or neighborhoods in Haifa, because they don't, or, or Nazareth, because they don't want to live next to Arabs. So in, in, that, in that respect, inside Israel is rather similar in some respects to Jim Crow, the Jim Crow South, with the, with the difference that, of course, Palestinians in Israel have the right to vote. In the Jim Crow South, they were, most, most African Americans were denied that right. Speaking of Chicago, there's that, Famous photo of you, or perhaps infamous, um, of you, uh, Professor Edward Said, and a young state senator in Chicago named Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. What did you guys discuss at that dinner, first of all, number one? And number two, if Obama was well-informed on Palestine, by the time he gets, to the, gets into office, what happens? I couldn't possibly tell you what we discussed at that dinner. It was quite a long time ago. Um, we left Chicago in 2003, and that that picture was probably taken in the 19, late 1990s. Hmm. Um, Obama was a state senator. 
um, the uh, South Side was his electoral district. And the I think it was the Arab American Action Network dinner that he and Michelle attended um, in order to you know get out the vote in the Arab American community. So does that mean that he was well informed on Palestine? I'm I'm not sure that that in and of itself proves that. I believe he he had he had a better than average understanding um, from discussions with him and 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 from you know the fact that he was pretty well educated and relatively worldly. Did that? change his political ambitions or his understanding of what it takes to climb up the greasy pole of American politics? No, not one bit. And he made that very clear from very early on in his political ascent. Uh, after he was defeated in a race for the first congressional district, uh, he decided he had to take a different course, and he did. And that meant whatever knowledge he may have had about Palestine was shoved to the side. Uh, and he had to adopt the conventional position of an American politician of kowtowing to whatever it is the Israeli lobby wants, which he did as a senator and as president. Yeah, he did quite successfully, too. What do you think in our current situation, our current moment, what do you think Edward Said would say right now? I mean, I have no idea. Uh, he would undoubtedly be as deeply distressed as all of us are uh, at the uh, immiseration of two million Palestinians. Uh, during this horrific war on Gaza. Uh, he would be as outraged as all of us are at the manifest bias of the mainstream media and of our craven politicians, some of whom probably do know better. Um, and at the attempt to shut down uh, advocacy for Palestine on American campuses um, with the spurious accusation that uh, advocacy for Palestine was anti-Semitic. Uh, I'm sure he would be as outraged as any of us at all of these things. In, in particular, the murderous treatment of over two million Palestinians, the, the incredibly inhumane treatment of, of so many people with American support, not, not just killing them, but starving them and dehydrating them and making them die of preventable diseases and of, of wounds that should have been treated. This is <clears throat> caused by Israel and the United States. This is not a natural catastrophe. And I think he would have been absolutely outraged by it. I think he was right. Oslo was a Palestinian Versailles. Oslo is a terrible, terrible agreement. All of us who were in the preceding negotiations in Washington understood that what the United States and Israel were prepared to give would not under any circumstances lead to an independent Palestinian state. It would lead at best to a Bantustan under Israeli control. And that is precisely what Oslo produced. It was a disaster for the Palestinians. And the very cynical game that Israel played, which I would be remiss not to mention in funding and supporting and allowing Hamas to grow uh, in Gaza. Um, just there, there's a history there that people can look into. Um, yeah, early on. In the, in, the, in the 1980s, it supported the Islamic movement and later of Hamas in its first stages was a cynical play, ploy, which has been repeated again and again to divide the Palestinian national movement. Yeah. What do you say to your ordinary person who's living in like Massachusetts or New Hampshire or wherever, who's supportive of the Palestinian cause, but, you know, they're not writers, they're not journalists or academics. Uh, maybe they've joined a protest, but maybe they don't even, they, they don't want to do that either. How can they exercise some power or influence, even if it's just one person? What can they do to support Palestine and Palestinians? I mean, it may sound sort of anodyne and, and, and simplistic, but I actually believe that bombarding uh, your local representatives with, you know, clear expressions of your views on these issues eventually will have an impact. You can see it at the at, at the base beginning to, to change. You can see city councils adopting resolutions, dozens of them, according to a reporter I spoke to from Reuters the other day. Dozens and dozens of local municipal councils are adopting resolutions calling for a ceasefire. Not, go, not necessarily even going farther than that, but that in, in certain circumstances is actually enough right now. Um, putting pressure on people in the house at, at the at, for the first time in the Senate and the House, there are consistent voices, a group of consistent voices, Senator Van Hollen, Senator Durbin, Senator, sometimes Senator Coombs, and a few others, Senator Murphy, 
uh, and, and uh, from a, a dozen to 30 or 40 members of the House who actually have already decided that they are going to brave the hundreds of millions of dollars that APAC will throw against them in primary uh, contests. Um, and I think that the more pressure is put on those people, uh, especially in the House and, in, and also some of them in the Senate, the, the more likely it will be that there will uh, sooner or later our politicians, which are always very slow to follow public opinion, will be forced uh, to do that. The other thing is the media. Constantly bombard the media with your disgust and your dissatisfaction and your anger at their bias and their one-sidedness. I mean, uh, admittedly, the kind of people who can see this are usually people who refuse to watch the mainstream uh, TV stations or read the mainstream press. But a lot of them do. And they should make their views very clear. Your views don't represent the views of a majority of Americans. You're representing a tiny, a small minority. And that's just not acceptable. Um, the other thing is boycott. The other thing that ordinary citizens can do is boycott. I refuse to buy this or that product because it, it overtly supports occupation or whatever the case may be. Um, that requires more effort. So you have to do some research. Um, finally, protest. I mean, there are protests all the time. Most of them are uh, 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 in cities. Most of them are in specific places. But um, if you're willing to do that kind of thing, uh, organize and protest. Um, you know, we can go back to the Vietnam War. We can go back to the Iraq War. And there was huge opposition to both of those wars. But it took years before the politicians finally caught up. In both cases, actually. It took years. Bush starts the, uh, the invasion of Iraq in 2003. It's not until years later that public opinion turns fully against the war. The same thing with the Vietnam War. Uh, Johnson escalates in 1964. It takes years before the United States leaves, finally. Um, so our politicians are extremely resistant, and our foreign policy establishment is re extremely resistant uh, to, to changing their, their set course. And uh, on Israel is one of the most intransigent positions any uh, uh, in American foreign policy that, 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 that there is. I mean, the only thing I can think of that was more you know, rock solid would have been anti-communism during the Cold War. You couldn't change that consensus. And right now, it doesn't seem like you can change this consensus. But public opinion is changing significantly <clears throat> in the Democratic Party, certainly, at, at, at the grassroots among young people across the political spectrum. And sooner or later, with continued pressure, uh, that can and, and must have an effect. And just recognizing that, you know, it's an election year and people can exercise their voices in the primaries, in the upcoming elections, in the debates. I mean, all kinds of this is a good year for people to 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 express their frustration. I know I asked you about Biden before, but I do want to ask this because um, it just comes up a lot. The sense of, well, Trump is going to be so much worse for Muslims and Palestinians. I wanted to get through this interview without mentioning him, but I think I want to hear it from you as well, that um, when this argument comes up, well, Trump is so much worse. Uh, I can't support him. So ergo, I have to go and support Biden, you know, hold my nose and support Biden. Maybe we'll get through four years. Maybe we could change things in those four years. How do you address that argument? I don't think this man will change. I think that Joe Biden formed his views back in the 60s and 70s. I think those are extremely firmly held views. I think his biased perception of Palestinians and his, I don't know what the word is, his uh, illusory perception of Israelis is not going to change in four years or in, if he lives so long, 40 years. Um, and I, I, I actually do think that the, this administration has been worse for Palestinians, Arabs, and Muslims uh, than the Trump administration has been. Now, will the next Trump administration be even worse than this one? Very possibly. Um, I just don't see how anybody with any moral sense can vote for Joe Biden uh, if, they, if they sincerely believe that what is being done is immoral and that the United States is responsible, at least in large part, for this immoral. Um, one only hopes that that can be beaten through the heads of Democratic politicians between now and November, and that they either change horses, which I recognize is unlikely, or they're, they're for some other reason, Biden drops out, in which case we may have a choice of a politician who, however craven and cowardly they may be, might not have the deep, unwavering, visceral dedication to Israel that this president has. I don't think that Trump has any such dedication. 
Trump is an opportunist. Trump will yeah. probably be very pro-Israeli because his base is pro-Israeli, the Republican base. Um, but I don't think that he will put uh, Israel above everything else. He'll put his own political survival above everything else. And if he sees American interests being harmed, which this president doesn't care about, this president will run American interests in the Middle East into the mud, into the dirt, below the ground, if need be, because of his blind support for Israel. I don't think he cares, as far as this issue is concerned, about anything but Israel and his pro-Israel supporters. I don't think that I think that Trump will be a worse president in most respects, and I, I will I would never vote for Trump. But uh, I don't think that if you're having a choice between the devil and the deep blue sea, you have to choose the deep blue sea because this one is the devil. Uh, I don't see how anybody with any moral sense can vote for Joe Biden, frankly. And I only hope that that will be brought home to, to Democratic elites uh, before it's too late. I, I have very little hope that that's the case uh, unless some unforeseen event takes place. He's likely to be the candidate. Uh, and we're going to be stuck with him. And I think he will lose, whether I vote for him or I don't vote for him, and I won't. But whatever I do or you do, uh, I think there are very large numbers of people who, whom he's completely alienated by his position on this. If the war continues and if he doesn't change his position, I think he's going to lose, partly because of this. He's probably going to lose anyway, the way things are going. Yeah, There's I agree. Um. I think the most important book on this, and I'll link to it in, in the show notes, is The Hundred Years' War on Palestine by yourself. But I wanted to get some book recommendations for you, which I like to ask at the end of every episode. So if there are a number of any number of books that have shaped you, Professor, or that you think in this moment people should read right now, uh, what would those books be? One of them would be Tariq Bakoni's book on Hamas, B-A-C-O-N-I, Tariq. Uh, another would be Nora Arekat's book on law in Palestine. Um, E-R-A-K-A-T is her last name. Um, and those are, I think, two books in the moment that really would help us to understand some of the core problems that we're, that we're, that we're dealing with. As far as books that uh, I would also recommend, uh, I hadn't thought about this. I know you, you mentioned this in the questions that you sent out to me. Um, I mean, there's a large, I think Edward Said's The Question of Palestine is a really good place to start. Um, I think the other place to look at is literature and poetry and, 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 and theater. Um, there's, a, there's an enormous amount of Palestinian literature that I think illuminates aspects of this um, that, that, that um, you won't necessarily get from history books or legal or, or, or sociological texts. Um, I, I could mention authors. There's so many of them out there. Um, but any uh, the poetry of Mahmoud Darwish, which is available in translation, uh, the plays of Ghassan Kanafani, um, Ibtisam Azam's wonderful book, uh, Day of Disappearance, I think it's called. Uh, there's a, there's a there's a, a vast range of literature out there. Um, most of it recent, but some of it like Kanafani and, and Fadwa Tuan's poetry and, and her novels um, uh, that, that was published quite a while ago, but all of it is available in translation. Uh, I would look to literature. Um, and then, you know, I, I, my stuff that I've written, a few other historians have written. Uh, Shireen Say Ali has a wonderful book on the Palestinian bourgeoisie. There are many, many very good histories uh, that you can look at. Um, but I would I would look to literature and poetry and 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 theater. Um, you know, the, the, the Kenafani has a wonderful novel, uh, Return to Haifa, where he talks about a Palestinian family going back to Haifa after they fled in 1948. They come back after 67, and they find the house that they used to live in inhabited by a Holocaust survivor. The encounter between this family and a Holocaust survivor, it's very touching. And it is an indication of how complex this issue is, and at the same time, not that complex, as we were talking about earlier. This is a San Kanafani, a man assassinated by the Israelis, by the way, talking about a return of a couple to Haifa to find their house inhabited by a Holocaust, a woman who's a Holocaust survivor. So, uh, I mean, that kind of thing, I think, gives you a sense of the humanity, the humanities involved. Um, I'm not an expert on Israeli literature, but there's a, there are a number of works in Israeli literature, which could also be illuminating and showing some of the complexities of this 
uh, that are not quite so complex as, as they're made out to be. Professor Rashid Khalidi, thank you so much for joining us on Minority Views Podcast. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Omar. I really appreciate you having, you're, you're having had me on this show.